I'm the Evan Spaceman, baby, I can fly. I'm a supersonic guy. Hi. I'm Ashley Doveday, the uh, Urban Space Man columnist for the Bristol Post newspaper. I, I managed to wrangle about 10 minutes uh, with Chris Hadfield while he was uh, passing through on a book tour uh, of You Are Here. And um, normally in, in these sorts of interviews, uh, you just record audio uh, just to save on making notes. But uh, I just saw the guy machining away, signing book after book, and I just had to get it on video. Now, it's worth noting that uh, he's able to sell these signed books for a bit more, but all of his profits are going to the Red Cross. Really commendable stuff. I'm more proud of this guy for what he's doing now than for his achievements of the past. Anyway, this is Chris Hadfield. Enjoy. Chris, what is the best advice your wife's ever given you? Uh, let's see, you mean today? Uh, let's see, the best <laughs> advice my wife has ever given me is don't ever say what the best advice my wife has ever given me while she's in the room. No, uh, best advice has probably been unspoken, which is uh, if you want to have a successful relationship, you need to honor and respect the dreams and wishes of your partner and allow them the freedom to pursue them, even if it means uh, the... Uh, the you want me to write deer, John? Yeah. Okay. Yes. The um, even if it means you know a small change in what you are doing or a change in what you are doing, it's really important to not um, identify yourself by the successes of your spouse. Okay. Uh, but it's a very long list of good advice my wife has given me. So they're asking me to pick from a from, from a, a big C. So you've been the, the Canadian equivalent of uh, a Top Gun fast jet pilot and an astronaut. And though you married your high school sweetheart, you've been surrounded by alpha males and alpha females throughout your life. Have you got any dating tips for, for the guys out there? <laughs> uh, dating tips? You're asking the wrong guy. It's been a long time since I took someone on a date. Um, actually, to me, someone say, you know, What's, what's the most attractive thing a woman can wear? And I think it goes for men too, and it's confidence. And not, not brazen or, or bragging confidence, but just uh, a confidence within yourself of who you are and what you've accomplished and what you're planning to do in life. And so I guess as, as a dating tip, um, have a plan and be confident in yourself and what you say. Um, but without attempting to inflict your confidence on anyone else. Okay. Well, uh, predicting the future is almost always a fool's game. Um, so when I'm trying to predict the future, it's, it's good just to sort of extrapolate from the past. And if we extrapolate from the past while, you can look at population growth. But I think the demonstrated example is being that in all civilized countries, population growth tends to tail off as quality of living increases. So I, I, although we're going to continue to increase in population, I don't think it's going to go exponential. So I think the real problem is dealing with the population we have right now, or one that's slightly larger, and how to raise the standard of living for as many people as possible to as high a possible level. And our main limitation in that right now is in our energy production. Uh, it's kind of at the root of everything, especially because it's chemical based. So I think the main uh, factor facing us for the time is how are we going to generate energy and how are we going to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels over the next hundred years. To me, that is the biggest challenge. Okay. Many astronauts return with an engorged affinity for humanity, and after retirement, many turn towards humanitarian efforts. Um, has your perspective changed much over the past, the past few decades? Did you have any epiphany moments during or after any of your space missions? I don't know of one astronaut uh, in the shuttle era that has had an epiphany moment. Uh, I think it's a, uh, a strongly reaffirming experience 
for the uh, set of beliefs and um, objectives that you had and the strengths that got you there. And um, I think the experience of flying in space reaffirms that. Uh, and in, in my case, I, I think it's the same way. My understanding of the world improves, uh, and it improves uh, at least in perspective fairly dramatically when you have a chance to see the world the way we do from the spaceship. Um, but it, it didn't suddenly dawn on me that I live on a ball that has limited resources or that um, we need to stop uh, burning fossil fuels a as the way to power the whole thing. Uh, so uh, I think if you were suddenly plucked off the street and put on a spaceship and taken for 10 orbits of the world, it might radically change your perspective. But the, the long training process and familiarity we have with the other astronauts' activities and the previous flights that have gone below before us, I think they help put it into the correct perspective just as much as uh, with the preparation as, as the experience itself. So that's why the epiphanies are rare. Sure. So you took about 40,000 photos up on the ISS. 45. 45,000 mm -hmm. photos. And shortlisted short it into this 208 page book. Yeah. What was your main objective with this book? What are you looking to imbue on the readers? Uh, I wanted people to see the world for what it truly is. Uh, not, not someone else's secondhand description of it, or not a, uh, a fanciful map or, or um, two dimensional or at least flat surface globe, but to actually see what the world really looks like in, in its infinite and ever-changing variety so that then you could start to think about it yourself and, and connect all of the, the wide changes within it in your own mind. So my objective really was to show people what the world truly looks like the best of my ability based on the 45,000 single images that I took. Okay. Aside from better propulsion systems and relaunchable uh, launch systems, what inventions do you feel we really need to master before manned interplanetary space exploration becomes feasible? We need a better power source. Not just propulsion system, but power source. We can't be relying on the little tiny bit of solar power that, that happens to arrive at that location. Um, in order to try and power what we're doing. We need a compact energy source like being able to truly harness the power that's in every single atom. That is the biggest impediment to, uh, to setting up habitation on another heavenly body. Coupling our growing obsession with risk aversion to the difficulty associated with international cooperation, do you feel a government-led manned mission to Mars is even possible in the coming few decades, or do you think a private entity coupled to the likes of SpaceX is more likely to do it? Who do you think will lead what the first successful manned mission to Mars? Um, well, there are no spaceships to take us to Mars right now. Um, they don't exist. And uh, the technology that we need in order to safely keep a crew alive um, across the vast reaches. Uh, we don't even know what we don't know right now. So uh, I think it's going to be a combination between private venture and government, no matter what we think. Yeah. And uh, But there is no great compelling reason to go, apart from curiosity. And that's not going to be enough to sustain the immense cost necessary with the technology that exists right now. Um, so One of the major arguments is that it's a sort of insurance policy for humanity. It's a second home. Right, but, but humanity is not uh, becoming extinct. So yeah, it's a second home. So is the moon. But, uh, but, the but we're a long way from going there. And so, so we need to... Um, we need to invent a lot of things between now and then so that, I mean, it, there were a lot of early explorers who died because they were 
uh, improperly prepared for the expedition. And we don't, there's no great advantage to being the early explorers who die. So I think we'll, um, we'll need to do continued work on station and then um, on the moon and then eventually, hopefully, have invented enough things that we can launch across the, uh, the interplanetary divide. Regarding a manned mission to Mars, let's assume we can deal with the microgravity and the radiation issues. From a psychological viewpoint, aside from having the entire world watching and applauding our explorers along the way, how will a manned mission to Mars be different from the epic voyages in the previous age of exploration? Um, well, uh, I don't think, the, the trouble is once you get any distance away on any sort of voyage, the epicness disappears and the reality becomes the foreground and the applause is long gone. So you need to be immensely involved with the mission itself and not in anybody else's estimation of either its size or its entertainment value. And that's going to be the real hard part, the psychological impact, especially uh, much like it must have been for Magellan when they spent weeks at sea uh, to spend weeks at sea in between the planets is going to be um, very repetitive and very difficult to take psychologically. How do you keep your crew motivated? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them in top form, ready to respond to a problem? Um, I think maybe the big difference will be they will no longer consider themselves earthlings within just a while. Earth will be a long lost memory and they will be uh, either citizens of their ship or citizens of the destination. So I think those crew on the way to Mars will think of themselves as Martians long before they get there. And, that, and I think that will be a healthy schism. If I were the commander of that crew, as soon as Earth started getting small, I would have a meeting at the table and talk about the fact that we are now Martians. And let's start doing everything we can to be the best Martians that have ever existed. Start thinking about all of the skills we're going to need and what life is going to be like and running simulations mm -hmm. of life on Mars and, and what the, you know, the, all of, start changing our day length to match the day length of Mars. And That's only half an hour longer. I, uh, uh, but the years are different and the solar cycles are quite different because the sun's so much weaker. So I think uh, trying to simulate the environment there would be healthy for the crew as well. Okay. All right. Great. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Lock your Soyuz hatch and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown engines on. Detach from station and may God's love be with you. This is ground control to Major Tom. This is me.